Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John works clothes with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for us as the people of God. Can you pray with me? Almighty God, I pray the words of my mouth and the thoughts on all of our hearts might be acceptable to you. O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our gospel lesson for today tells us about the baptism of Jesus. The version that we heard was John's account. We could have just as easily read Matthew's or Luke's or John's. The baptism of Jesus appears in all four gospels. And I think that just goes to show how important the baptism of Jesus was to the very early church. And the reason that the baptism of Jesus was important was because it linked Jesus with John the Baptist. And it also linked him with uh, the prophets in the Old Testament, specifically that of Isaiah. And another reason that it was important was because it provided a visual symbol of Jesus' humility, who in the words of the Apostle Paul, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Now looking back at the baptism of Jesus, what that did was usher in his time in ministry. And I'm going to take this off because my mic just is not staying where it's supposed to. There we go. All right, so what this did was it ushered in the time of ministry uh, for Jesus. Right after he came up out of the Jordan, he went out to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And it was there that he was tempted by Satan. And all of this would eventually lead to Jerusalem and to the cross. So in this sense, the baptism of Jesus is that one moment where all this anticipation that we, and the hope surrounding his birth and all the experiences of his early life come together in this one aha moment where we see that he clearly is the son of God. Mark says it like this. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you. I am well pleased. And then the verse that we didn't read was the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. That's verse 12. And today on this baptism of the Lord Sunday, we have the opportunity to remember what it means to be baptized in his name. And I say that making a fairly large assumption here. And that assumption is that most of us, maybe all of us are baptized. There's some of you that may have been baptized uh, as youth or maybe as young adults in your life, but probably the majority of us were baptized uh, when we were very young, as when we were infants. And I learned during my time at Sioux Falls Seminary that that's not exactly a practice that our Baptist friends really understand or embrace. They, they don't do infant baptism. And the reason they don't do it is they, they ask a question, how could a baby, who sometimes is as young as just a And to answer that question, I share a story about a couple of pastors who were in a bit of a debate with noted liturgical scholar Dr. James White. And they asked Dr. White, what if the child slept through the whole service of the baptism? Wouldn't that nullify the whole experience? And Dr. White responded by saying, well, for all I know, I was asleep during my own baptism, but God wasn't. More often than not, God works without our knowing. And God's love and grace is in no way contingent on our understanding or our awareness. 
And I think that right there, brothers and sisters, is key. Baptism is not just about us. It's about God's saving acts in Jesus Christ. Every time that we baptize an individual, whether that someone is a baby or someone who is 90 years old, we proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we are offered eternal life. <clears throat> and personally, I think that infant baptism is the perfect symbol of our covenant relationship with our Creator. And what I mean by that is that when we come before God, all of us come before God as infants in God's sight. And that's regardless of our age or our accomplishments or our abilities. I mean, there's no one of us that can comprehend God's grace or claim that we're worthy of God's love, but God claims us anyway and invites us into a loving, trusting relationship. Not because we're deserving of it, but because, well, that simply is the nature of God. And think about it this way. You all love your children. If you don't have children, you can think of other people that have children that you really like, maybe uh, uh, nieces or nephews, brothers or sisters. You love those children long before they're able to love you in return. You love them no matter how much they may disappoint you, how many times they fall short of the mark. So doesn't it stand to reason that God, who loves more than we're possibly capable of loving, will love us long before we're able to love God in return? Or Jesus said, if there are anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your parent in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The infant baptism is an important part of our relationship with God in, a, in an additional way as well. Because it's not the infant who is asking to be baptized. It's the parent who asks on the child's behalf. Acting in faith, they can claim a place in God's kingdom for their child. And that child is made a part of God's great family long before they know what is really going on. And as a pastor, I have been asked by parents if it would be better to wait for a child to grow up so that they could make that decision on their own. And even before I was a parent, my answer has remained the same, and that is no. I mean, you don't wait for a child to grow up before you give them a name, do you? You don't wait until they prove to be responsible before they have a place in your family, right? They belong from day one, and they'll learn to appreciate what that means as they grow older. I mean, the same thing could be true of our country. I mean, children don't grow up before they're considered citizens of the United States. They're considered citizens at birth. Later on, we teach them the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem, but they're citizens long before they know what any of that means. When I was in college, I minored in psychology, and I remember reading one time that a child's basic traits are developed by the time that they're five years old. So by the, teen the time they're teenagers, their faith, or sometimes their lack of it, is already decided. And if it's not by us, it's by somebody else which can be kind of scary with the amount of media that's available today. So Methodists and Lutherans, along with many other denominations, baptize children at a very early age. In the United Methodist tradition, in our liturgy, we pledge to do all in our power to increase their faith so that they can grow in the knowledge and the love of God until they make that profession of themselves. And that happens at confirmation. And that's really what confirmation is. It's not just joining the church. When you get right down to it, confirmation is deciding to accept your baptismal vows for yourself. Now, whether you were baptized as an infant or as a youth or even as an adult, whether or not you remember the experience, whether you have a baptismal certificate to prove it, I'm guessing that most of us are baptized. So the question might be is, so what? What does it mean? Does it really make that much of a difference? if you're baptized or not. Well, brothers and sisters, if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. It does make a difference. It makes all the difference in the world, and not just because you get to go to heaven when you die. Baptism is not some sort of strange insurance policy. That's a reduction of what it is. It's much better than that. It's much more than that. It means that God is with you in the here and the now, not just when you die, but right here, right now. And God will continue to be with you in every situation and in every circumstance that you face in life. And God will give you the grace 
you need to make it. Here's what God said to the prophet Isaiah. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flame will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now in in Scripture, the water and the sea typically stand for all those things that are opposed to God. Chaos, sin, destruction, death. You can actually see that if you look at the opening passages of Genesis. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the waters. The opening two chapter verses of Genesis, which certainly isn't a picture of Disney World, is it? Before God gave the word, the universe seemed to be one of the most hostile and dangerous places there was. Then God spoke, and there was light. God spoke, and the waters were pushed back so that there was air to breathe and dry ground to stand on. But look closely there, because God did not destroy the waters. God simply put the waters in place. And that's important. The the ancient Hebrews had an interesting understanding of all of this. Their world was a three-tiered world. There was water above, there was water below, and in between there was this thin slice of earth that they lived on. Now, how did they know there was water above? Simple. The sky was blue. They figured there must be some sort of invisible shield that held it back, and besides, every now and then that shield would leak and water would come pouring down. And how did they know there was water below? Simple, dig enough, and eventually you're going to find water. Besides, every once in a while, that water would rise all on its own. It would flood everything in sight. So it didn't take them long to figure out that if the water started to fall down from above and rise up from below, it wouldn't take long before they'd all die. But in the meantime, God held the waters back. God kept the waters at bay, which made every day a gift of God's grace. So the ancient Hebrews knew, and I think that we need to remember, that those waters are still there. And what I mean by that is that the presence of evil is still around today. And I think that is what makes the baptism of Jesus so important. Jesus went down into the waters of baptism to break the power of sin and death. It's one way of saying that he descended into hell. All that are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit share in Christ's victory over sin and death, knowing how, no matter how deep the water may get in our lives, God is with us, and God will keep us from going under. And I can give you some examples of that, like a young couple who has a few unforeseen expenses, and before you know it, they're drowning in a sea of credit card debt. Or a middle-aged woman who gets a pink slip at work And it's told that it has nothing to do with her gender or her age. It simply is a matter of downsizing. Or a woman whose husband of 30 years suddenly dies of cancer. And she finds herself drowning in waves of grief. Or a middle-aged man who goes to work day after day and wonders why he even bothers. The fire in him has long since gone out. But he knows there are still others that are depending on him to support them or a mother of two young kids that seem to be always getting sick. She's tired and exhausted, and when she asks her husband to help, he says that he needs to have time with his friends. Or an elderly woman who gets up and goes to the kitchen. The house is wrecked, the faucets are dripping, the carpet's stained, but it's all she can do to get up and make a cup of coffee and feed the cat. Not making these things up, brothers and sisters. They happened. They still happen. It's part of everyday life. And I think it just goes to show how the waters of chaos threaten to overwhelm us. Some days we're able to be strong and withstand the curtain. There are other days when it seems like at any moment we could go under. Now, it is true that God didn't take the waters away. But God gave us a promise that God will be with us no matter what. And the baptism of Jesus is key here. Jesus went down into the waters of baptism and broke the power of sin and death so that all who are baptized in the name of Jesus know that God is with us, that we're not alone, and that God's grace will be 
sufficient for us. There's a song that we're about to sing, and it has these opening words. I was there to hear your warning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. That is a promise that we can count on. And for it, I say thanks be to God. Amen.